This is Bob Baker with Jazz Guitar Today, and we are um, here this morning with Farid Haq, the uh, modern guitar virtuoso. You know, I, we try to make these, these kind of short. Uh, I was talking with Tony Monaco the other day, who I know you've spent a lot of time with. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, Tony has played with a lot of great guitar players, and he just couldn't stop talking about you. Oh, and I said, well, why, why, haven't I, why haven't I asked Farid if he'd like to be on, you know, or like to be in the magazine? And I didn't have a good answer for that at all. I said, it's, it's an oversight on my part. So I, I, I accept that. You, you're, you're a pretty mind boggling, actually. Um, you know, you play classical guitar, you've composed for classical guitar, you play jazz, everything from jazz versions of Neil Young's Helpless, Stephen Stills is four and 20, you know, all the way up to, you know, all kinds of renditions of the, of the standards that you would expect. Um, you know, you're, you play, you have a, you played funk, you've played world music, you, you know, all, I mean, just all, all over the page, everywhere. And, you know, normally the first question would be, well, which one do you like the most? I'm anticipating your answer, but go ahead and, and say, <laughs> where, where, where do you, where do you sit? Where do you love, what do you enjoy playing? I, I think that we kind of get this mindset that, that music is sort of one thing with many different variations. And I like to make the argument that music really is many different things for many different people. You get teenagers full of angst who need to hear those sad, drippy pop tunes, you know. <laughs> but then you, when you reach a certain age and all of a sudden you're just like, I don't think I can even relate to that song anymore, you know, unless there's some nostalgia associated with it. And so there's all these, you might be like in a certain situation on a romantic evening and you hear something with a thumping bass and it just sounds amazing to you you know and then uh you know you're going to the uh the the, the wedding or the catechism of your your daughter mm -hmm. and you hear someone drive by with that same thumping bass and you're like oh that's disgusting why is that all even even legal <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I i think there are as many different kinds of music as there, as there are people and as there are emotions the, the difficulty and success that I've had are all wrapped around the fact that I've always loved classical music. Classical music, I think, opens a door to all kinds of music and all kinds of musical experiences. It also changes the way you view other music. You know, if you're playing Stravinsky or for a guitarist that might be, you know, Britain or Bagatelles or something, modern music, Brower, whatever, you're not going to be as inclined to need to get that out of a jazz experience. Does that make sense in a way? No, I got, I got you. I'm with you. It's like if, I, if I'm going to play classical style of music, well, maybe I'll just pick up my classical guitar and play classical music. And when I sit down with Tony, I'm not really trying to force a, a square peg in a round hole. You know, my job and my pleasure with Tony is to swing, right? right. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And, you know, as a classical guitarist, I kind of get that itch scratched, but then you don't really scratch the the groove situation, you know. And then when you play jazz that's sort of semi-classical and not grooving, it sort of becomes, to me, kind of pointless, you know. And then when I play with Tony and it's just swinging so hard, it makes the hairs on your arm stand on end, and it, it then that really has meaning, you know. Sure. I think a lot of musicians try to try to put all of their musical ideas into one bucket, and sometimes it, you just get a, a mess. So, what I like to talk about is what are you doing today? What what's uh, what's keeping you busy right now? What's keeping you motivated? Well, there's a, it, it's it's especially now. That's that's the best question there is because the past is gone. You right. know, I was you know just recently touring you know, internationally with Billy Cobham and his group. He just put out a new album that features the, the current band. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim Landers, Scott Tibbs, myself, uh, Paul Hansen and Randy Brecker. We had, you know, all these tours booked and due to COVID, all of that was canceled. I recently retired from the university and, it, and had done so to fill up my schedule with the touring that was coming my way. <laughs> Garage Mahal had a tour. So it's like I cut off my head and then I cut, you know, off my legs. <laughs> right. <laughs> and 
I was just staring at the wall for about a couple of weeks, kind of in a pretty deep funk, you know, right. I kind of had to, to, to rekindle my, my flame for right. what I do because it, it had become, okay, the next three months I have that tour and that tour and that tour and I'll be home these days to be with the family and I'm making this much money, which is going to pay those bills and we're good, you know, and all of a sudden, all of that disappeared. I was forced to reassess everything and it's been kind of, kind of, kind of good, but kind of interesting. So I'm involved uh, with a, a group called the Chicago Immigrant Orchestra um, that I've been uh, directing along with a great Ud, Udist uh, from Palestine named Wanis Zarur. Mm -hmm. And uh, try to say that three times fast. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say the spelling later. He's no great. way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right? and, um, and so that's been this group that's been bringing together all these musicians from around the world, but in more of an integrated way. You know, a lot of world music tends to be, you know, here's a little bit of Ireland and here's a little bit of Uruguay and here's a little bit of right. India, here's a little bit of China. And, and we actually are taking a different tack, which is let's write some music that uses all these instruments and traditions for what they actually do. Oh, I love that. So you actually have an orchestration with a Tibetan throat singer holding down the drone for a Hindustani singer. And then the oud is playing the bass on the samba that I'm playing a, a jazz guitar solo on kind of thing. So it's, it's real neat. I absolutely love that. It's more, it's, it's more about the music and less about the theater of world music, so to speak. Sure. You know? Um, not so much That's about the a very good way to put that, by the way, the theater of world music. Yeah, sometimes it's more about costumes than about the actual what's happening. But anyway, um, so that's happening. And you can see that online if, if one wants to go to the, I think it's a uh, cityofchicago.org YouTube channel. And mm -hmm. there's a beautiful concert there that we produced. The World Music Institute in New York is uh, just recorded uh, a duo, myself and Goran Ivanovich have a duo and we have a new album out that's i guess up for a grammy that's exciting yeah that's very exciting and uh, so we did a concert recently at city winery sold out sold out which which city winery chicago city winery chicago city winery yeah, sold out everybody's thinking you know 350 people screaming and crawling all over each other there were 50 people in there sold out <laughs> sold out <laughs> we have a club we have a club down in atlanta called the, the velvet note and it's uh -huh. only 50 seats, and now she's down to 16. 16 is a sellout. Okay. That's all she'll allow in. I mean, and, and it's, it's great. You know, I mean, we, we're doing, everybody's doing the best they can, but this is changing the face of the music scene. You know, it really Absolutely. is. Absolutely. So, so we had that show. Um, I'm doing a tribute to West Montgomery on, on Wednesday with really? a great little band, local band out of Chicago. It's just they, the city of Chicago and a lot of places are doing these, these nice events. Right, um, putting money in musicians' pockets, and it's a, it's a nice event, you know. So mm -hmm. it's gonna be good, and I, I love all those West tunes. I don't normally play them because I'm kind of that thought that like West did a pretty good job. Not bad, you yeah. know. And I'm like, I really feel like when you cover something, you have to bring something to the table that's that's you know unique and and special, if if or at least better. When I did the CSNY covers. I think part of the re rationale was they were really great composers and really great singers. And they were really going after these really progressive ideas in terms of their arrangements, but they really couldn't pull off an authentic Latin groove, you know, right. and it sounded great what they did in the context, but wow, what if you actually did, you know, take that that's full distance, you know, how would that work? And it worked out pretty well, but people have asked me, why don't you cover like, you know, Led Zeppelin presence or cover, you know, our experience by Hendrix. And I'm just like, you, you don't cover a classic. Yeah. A classic establishes its own, own rules in a way you can refer to it. Maybe it's inevitably, you know, pale just because everything down to the microphones made that classic. <laughs> Very well put. Though I will say one of the projects that's in, in the works right now, um, I just have been speaking with Pat Martino. Uh, Pat okay. and I are, are acquainted, we're friendly. And um, one of the projects that I've wanted to do for a long time, um, and he's given me written permission to, to announce this, so I'm not overstepping my bounds here, I hope. But um, I wanted to do a, an album of uh, my version of the Joyous Lake album. 
Oh, wow. Um, wow. And uh, so uh, Pat and, and his friend Wolf are looking up. He's uh, digging up charts right now from the original sessions. And then I'm going to record those tunes and uh, probably donate the, uh, the proceeds or a portion of the proceeds to, uh, to, uh, to Pat and uh, make sure that Pat's okay. We did a big story on Pat for his birthday last year, his 75th. Uh, Joe D'Onofrio and I are pretty tight. Yeah, Joe's good people. Yeah, really, really, really great. And um, I and I got to know Wolf. Uh, in fact, we're going to be doing something similar with Wolf uh, that we're doing with you right now. And Excellent. I didn't. It, Wolf had told me, and I didn't know this at the time, but we were looking for people to talk about Pat. He said, "Well, I had transcribed all of those records, you know, back." So he he transcribed all of Pat's stuff, you know. And so that's obviously why you're you're getting with him on that. But that what a labor of love that was. Now now actually it's really coming to benefit for this project that's really cool you know that that album i mean if you think about that album is it's got a singular place in in jazz history and a singular place in jazz guitar history i i look at myself as i don't want to make this come out the wrong way but my best hope would be to be viewed as someone taking pat's legacy into the 21st century not not that i'm trying to compare myself to his himself in any way because i mean He's the man, you know, but I think Pat is singular in that he is one of the only jazz guitarists who brought, and I say this very specifically, who brought jazz guitar to modern jazz post Bob and didn't necessarily abandon his jazz roots in the way that most other guitarists did when they started experimenting with fusion. He was, the, he was probably the only guy who, was doing the pentatonics that McCoy was doing, was, was playing Wayne and Train tunes, but wasn't necessarily saying, well, let's forget the traditional jazz sound, the traditional jazz approach, the swing that's inherent in, in, in that kind of playing that I, I feel like I'm kind of carrying that torch as best I can. You know, I, I hadn't really thought of it in those terms, but now that you're describing it the way you describe it, I, I, I see what you're saying and I totally agree with you on that, that particular record. Cause I know that's one that I listened, I wore that record out back in the day. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh. And you know, and I've played a, a handful of those tunes. I'm not really a transcriber. I, I've learned a lot of Pat music and, and learned a lot of his lines, but I tend to take little bits of things and then sort of turn them into, you know, my own language, a kind of a system where I'll take a lick and break it down and then do all kinds of versions to it. And, and, and find ways that, that it becomes personal to me. But I'm really, you know, honored that Pat's, you know, given me permission to do this and sure. encouraged it. And, and as a bit of a, you know, as, as good a mandate as one could, one could hope for at this point to, to do that kind of project. Well, absolutely. I think that's an honor for, for him, for you to address it in the first place. And it's an honor for you for, you know, for him to say to you, yeah, I mean, all the people that, you know, to say to you, you know, please with my blessing, go and do this. I think this is wonderful. I mean, I think it's a, it's a great thing for, for both of you. And I can't think of anybody that I'd rather see do it. I think you're doing an amazing job with it. I mean, um, you're, you're the most eclectic player that I know of right now on the modern scene and, and, and that I can even imagine. I don't, can't imagine anybody's more eclectic than that. There are a lot of people who are eclectic, but you take it to a completely different level. Um, I just wanted to, to say for people who are watching this when, when they watch it, that you really owe it to yourself to go onto YouTube and check out for Reed Hawks, all of the videos and, and don't just watch one or two and go, oh, I know what he does. No, you don't. You gotta watch about 20 different ones and see all the different styles and languages and the, and the musicians that you bring in, you know, all these traditional instruments that you bring in. I see you sitting in almost like a Shakti kind of thing, you know, and then I see you in a funk band. Then I see you with Tony doing that thing. Tony Monaco is, for those of you who don't know, is a, a great organist, uh, one of the world's best. When people come to you and say, Farid, I want to, I want to, I want to study with you. What are the typical weaknesses that you have to address with most players? Is there any one category you go, well, most people need to know more about this, or it's all over the page, or, I mean, I realize everybody's going to have strengths and weaknesses, but is there something you can, is there a theme to this at all? Well, I would say that there's, there's two threads in, in my teaching mm -hmm. that, that have, 
kind of refined themselves over the years. And the one is distinguishing between the skills you need to play the guitar well and the skills you need to play jazz. And they're not really the same. And not because of the teachers, because of the, some of the books, really. So I really believe that jazz evolved from a five-note approach. But not just the minor blues scale, the major blues scale, which we don't usually treat, and the minor blues scale. And if you use those two scales as your departure point, but really embrace a theoretical, analytical approach to those scales, sure, we can add chromaticism into a, into a blues scale. We can add chromaticism and approach tones into a, a major or minor blues scale. Major and minor blues scales move by minor thirds, which gives you the diminished tritone sounds that are so common in jazz. Um, and you start looking more and more deep. And, you know, my dad's a scientist, so he, he has an analytical mind, and I kind of inherited some of that, I guess. A little bit of it, Fareed. A little bit of it. <laughs> <laughs> and you start analyzing solos and saying, what if I looked at the template of this Charlie Parker solo and made it a five-note blues scale instead right. of a seven-note major scale? And you say, wow, with a, with a seven-note major scale, I've got to change that template every few bars. With a five-note scale, I change the notes I fill into the scale, but the template stays the same. I, I, right? like, that, I like that approach, yeah. I'm, I'm, so, you know, the, the greatest example of this, and I, I, I take almost all of my, my intermediate and advanced students through this, is we'll sit there and play rhythm changes. Then they'll say, you know, B flat, G7, C minor, F7, D minor, G7, F minor. And they're trying to arpeggiate all those and play all the scales that go with those and the modes and... You no, know, it's Lydian here, and it's <laughs> and and, every, and and you know just we get one or two courses into it, and and everybody you know, everybody falls flat, especially at a fast tempo, right? Right. And then I'm like, well, rhythm changes is just the opposite of blues. Blues was the minor blues scale with a little major blues scale thrown in there. Rhythm changes was the major blues scale with the minor blues scale thrown in there. Now, yes, you can add in chromatics, you can add in the arpeggios to each chord when you choose to, but here's your basic template. The amazing is. Not that they start to play notes that sound good. That's, that's nice, but that's not the real key. The key is that for the first time, you can focus on rhythm. The rhythm changes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, swing, that's, that's just, you got nothing, right? I, I, I love that. Is there, um, out, is there a particular course that, uh, that, that they should look at on True Fire that outlines what you just talked about? Absolutely. Um, the first one is actually one of the more recent ones. We kind of did things in reverse order. But the Soul Jazz Survival Guide. S-O-U-L so, so, or S-O-L-E? Yeah. S-O-U-L. And then the next step on that is the Jazz Rock Workshop. Okay. There's one other thing I wanted to, um, to acknowledge that I saw that, that you're, um, you talked about, which I'm a big believer in, and that is the two-note chord when comping in a band. I just, you know, I just did that because I got tired of the bass player throwing rocks at me. <laughs> <laughs> right right we're both having emotional scars as well yeah i mean you know but uh for people that that don't know um staying out of the way of your other fellow musicians on the bandstand is at the is at the core of the, the two note chord and uh, i'm not going to give that away i'll let them look up some of that you know from you because that's a, that's a very important concept well yeah and i think one of the interesting side notes here is you know a lot of folks look at what I do and, and think about, you know, Pakistan dad and Chilean mother and world music and all this, but I really grew up musically on Vaughn sets on the South side of Chicago. A big part of that was learning how to exist in a rhythm section. And the truth is, you know, Jim Hall, even though my playing isn't anything like that, I've done, done a lot of records with singers where I, I really embrace that Jim Hall approach. And he was very key, uh, uh, in his approach to, uh, to, to really build his chords from the inside out, from the, the, the basic two notes on the middle strings to build them out as you need to, really evolved. I think he's the other guy, along with Pat Martino, who, who brought the guitar into the 21st century, oh, for I, sure. I, I love Jim Hall. I mean, you, you, you know, the guys that you love, I love. You know, I, I got it, you know. And, um, oh, man, the bridge, right? What more? <laughs> Your playing is, um, you know, you're extremely articulate. You're clean as can be. 
clean as a whistle when I hear you play. Your timing is impeccable. I mean, you know, and that's a Pat Martino trait. Pat's timing is the best I've ever heard. He just, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's just the best I've ever heard. Uh, I was telling, uh, what's his name, his drummer, I'm sorry, I, I should, I, I interviewed his drummer too. I said, that's, that's, you got a hell of a job in front of you to, because <laughs> Pat leads right. the band. <laughs> wow. But uh, at any rate, but you, you have that in your playing as well. And um, the interesting thing, I, I, I guess, I mean, yeah, you, you know, Pakistani father, Chilean mother and all that kind of stuff. But you grew up in Chicago. So how do you, how do you in your own mind reconcile your sense of rhythm what, 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 how would you characterize how it got formed and, and all of that? Because for those of you who aren't familiar with Reed's work, uh, you need to get that way because, uh, because his sense of rhythm is just crazy. So anyway. I have spent most of my career, I don't want to say career, I want to say most of my passion in music has been about getting that feeling. And the feeling of the music is about timing. You know, people like Wes and Pat and Jim, you know, Pat Metheny, of course, so many. Like timing is is orders of magnitude more deep than than lining quarter notes up with a metronome or eighth notes or sixteenth notes. You know, it's Absolutely. it's being able to do that, but then the emotional power of laying back, of playing ahead of the beat, and I think you really get that from playing the blues a lot. I mean, I'm basically a Chicago blues player with a, with chops. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's funny you say that because, you know, I mean, I, everybody that I interview says about the same thing. I'm really a blues player. It seems yeah. like everybody says that. I don't care who well, they are. And I think it's, 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 it's imperative that, that jazz musicians step out of their comfort zone and embrace the blues community. Because I was surprised speaking to some blues music. You know, I, I'm on Delmark and got a couple of albums coming out on Delmark at some point here. The reason world music and, and me work well together is because world music is really international blues. It really yeah. is. When you can play a blues solo, and you know, blues is, I like to say that European classical music is prose. You know, Beethoven wrote a novel, <laughs> right? And, but Train wrote a poem. You know, blues tunes and blues music is repetitive music. It's about repeating. And I always make this joke to my students. I'm like, hey, you know, you go to a blues festival. There's, you know, three days. It's packed. It's sold out. Everybody's having a great time. Every band, 12 bands, three days. They're all playing the same song. Right? Oh, and so you're like, it's a really good song. We should get with that yeah. song. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, There's three or four different feels and three or four different, uh, you know, tempos. But that's about it. Yeah, I'm being euphemistic, of course. Of course, they're all. <laughs> but it's just kind of a funny thought that, like, wow, you know, they go and they hear, and, and then the guys, the band starts, and it's like, yeah, that's the blues. You know, that's yeah. that thing, that I love, right? And the thing about the blues that a lot of jazz musicians don't get is that it's about repetition. Rock players get that. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, you know, funk musicians get that. And I think that's where I got drawn to that world is because I was maybe because of so many other influences i just began to accept that the feeling of jazz was in the repetition and not being afraid of what that means you know right. does it mean it has to be mechanical repetition of course it's variation you know you're basically saying the same thing again and again and again and and it's very related to those afrocentric roots of, of trance so when that blues you know sets its its home well, that's all about feel. Now, how do you get that feel and play more notes? Well, I mean, yeah, it's something that like I could play more notes, but if it didn't have that feel, right, I would kind of throw it out. And so I've definitely compromised a certain level of cleanliness for a certain level of articulation and intensity. You know, like, I mean, there's, you know, there's like the cleanliness of like an, an Al Gimiola, um, who I, you know, respect immensely for his, you know, brilliant technique and, you know, some of his fun tunes, but it's, you know, very articulate. Maybe another example would be, you know, some of the, uh, the, the, the heavy metal players, like from Mr. Big, um, Paul Gilbert, you know, it's so clean, you know, but at a certain point it becomes a little computerized, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a big conversation. I totally agree with you. Um, and I don't have a problem with it. At a certain point, I only say, well, 
we have a machine that can do that now. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've spent a lot of time listening to players um, and asking the question, why is this person compelling and this person is not so much? Hmm. And it gets down to, it gets down to feel, basically. It gets down to feel. It's not the notes. And the nuance is between you're talking about being behind the beat, in front of the beat, on top of the beat. How far behind? How far in front? And what's that mixture? With, what, what, what did, or you did that on that beat, but what did you do on this beat? And is that building energy or is it diminishing energy? And all that. This is the kind of stuff I know that you'd be very hip to, but most people don't. They're not, they feel it. It's like what they say about pornography. I, I can't explain it, but I know what it is when I see it. You know, <laughs> They feel it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I lose you there. No, I'm, I'm back. That was a Supreme Court justice who said that. Oh my God. Yeah, that's Max Thomas, I hope. Yeah, she said, I, I can't define pornography, but I can tell you what it is when I see it. But it's the same thing. It's this, this fine nuance of, of feel that, that the greats all have. They, they just they draw you in by playing with your your own rhythms and things like that. Exactly. It, it is kind of, I mean, I don't listen to musicians that much anymore. I listen to comedians. I mean, Richard Pryor has got to be the greatest jazz drummer on the planet. <laughs> you know, because his timing, if, if you can lay a, a phrase out the way Richard does, right. Bill Burr, Doug Stanhope, man, these guys, their timing is incredible. And it's, it's one of these things where you can't classicize it, right? Right. You can't, like, there's a certain lick you might play in jazz that if you don't land on your feet, nobody's going to, like, throw you out. Then right. you're like, eh, well, it's all right, but, you know, you're not going to not get paid. Richard Pryor doesn't land on his feet on that punchline two or three of those in a row. And yeah. I've seen, uh, who's, my, who's our, our boy? Uh, oh, so great. Um, Dave Chappelle, when he did that uh, coronavirus special. And he got up there and, and, and his timing was just off because he was so not in a funny mood. Yeah. Because it was serious, this whole, you know, this is just after George Floyd's tragedy and right. murder, I should say. And his timing was off. And at a certain point, he was just like, y'all, I'm out of here. This is not working. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, you know. It's good I, for him to know that. Right? Because it's so yeah. obvious. So, so you really, you know, does, is this lick, not is the lick played correctly, does this lick make me laugh? Right. Does this lick have that emotional, you know, man, Julian Bream is a great model for me in a lot of ways. Julian Bream. He, yeah, I listened a lot to Julian Bream. And what a great, I mean, maybe not a great jazz musician in terms of, I'm sure he knew some songs, but he wasn't like, you know. No, but like, his, his, his classical playing had, had texture to it that I don't hear in other people's classical playing. So and, a lot of feel in his playing. And if you listen, there's a couple of recordings of him playing uh, Nuage with Stefan Grappelli. You know, I've, I've, I heard it briefly and it wasn't that long ago. Um, I don't know. I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. I hate to say that. but uh, Well, I mean, he, he was just playing the tune, like yeah. with changes, you know. And then at a certain point, he played one of those bends and he nailed it just like Django does. <laughs> you know, it wasn't so much that he did it. But he did it just like Django with yeah. the vibrato and the little shake on the end and all that wiggle that, that makes it cool, yeah. you know. And you're just like, wait a second. He gets that. He yeah. may not have pursued it as a career, but he gets that essential thing. And I think that that's why his classical playing, like you said, had so much, much charm and it so much. Feel and charm. Charm is a good word for it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you listen to a lot of classical players and they get through the notes and they get through the pieces okay, but... They don't, I, they didn't touch me. You know, it's like even Pavarotti, um, you know, there were times when, you know, I've heard other people sing things cleaner than he sang it, you know, but nobody right. sang it with that passion. Nobody sang it with that feel. And nobody was as big, I must face it. <laughs> I mean, he just, you know, he, huge. Larger than life. Well, that he is the quintessential statement of larger than life. Absolutely. But there were a couple of times if, you know, when he, get, he didn't feel like doing it, you could, he didn't phone it in. I won't say that, but you know, you knew that phrase was not as clear as he even he would like it to have been. And yeah. there are other people that their phrases are dead spot on, but there's no life, there's no feel. And maybe he did that on purpose to draw you. And who knows, a guy that that masterful. Right. You know. I mean, I think an important thing for me was realizing that ninety percent of my skill as a jazz musician would be demonstrated in my ability to play the melody of a song. Oh, absolutely. 
And I think a lot of folks are like, well, I'm going to play the melody and then I'm going to get into my solo because that's the important part. You know, I did that, didn't I? Get into my solo. Yeah, no, I, no very well done. I like that. It's a uh, like camera work. And TV, we got that going on. Oh well, listen, um, <laughs> thank you very much for that. I don't have to take any drugs today. <laughs> hey, before we uh, uh, let go, I should uh, I want to give a little plug to to the new guitar that Brian is building for me. Please, please, please. Um, because you know this is like the sixth prototype that we've built, and I've got to say that Brian is really onto something. Well, tell um, me about your. Tell me about Brian. People might well, know. Brian Gallup from. Uh, Gallup School of Luthery. He's an incredible luthier who's been, uh, you know, teaching luthery as well as building guitar. He just built a guitar for Joe Bonamassa. Right. Uh, he's been building for all the greats. But he's also really on the cutting edge of using technology to empower luthery, okay. not to replace luthery, which is what a lot of folks have done, but to empower it. So we're actually using the kinds of measurements and sensitivities that one gets from the wood and trying to quantify that so that his CNC machines can do the cutting, you know, and make it, you know, spot on perfect and get those resonances exactly where they need to be. And then, you know, obviously there's some by hand in there too, but so this design is an arch top guitar, mm -hmm. experimented with a few different shapes with no F holes. I saw, solid one, I saw one that you play without any F holes. Right. Solid top, flat back, a very small sound post between the bridge and the back, uh, the back tuned at the top. And it looks like a traditional jazz guitar. It sounds like a traditional jazz guitar, but I would say that almost all of the problems that you associate with traditional jazz guitars avoided, if not solved, frankly. Wow. So I was playing a full depth arch top with Billy Cobham, who can be the softest, but can also be the loudest drummer on the planet. Right. Double bass drums. Full depth, arch top, no feedback ever, right? I mean, I'm sure you can make a feedback just like you'd make a Les Paul feedback or something, sure, you know, yeah, but, but no actual feedback. Like I had a Guild Artist Award, which I just loved. I had one of those. And I would play it in my studio and just love it. And then I'd take it on the gig. And I, by the time I was done EQing the feedback out. You had nothing left. I, there was nothing left. And I had a guy. Yeah, little, the, you had the little Dearman pickup in there. <laughs> I had a guy come to me once after a recording session and said, man, that's a great jazz tone for a Strat. <laughs> I, I just about pooed my pants because I was I like, had, I, had artist know, award, I had artist award number 138. Oh, early ones. I, I, would, I would have kept it, you know, just as my closet guitar because I love it so much. Mm -hmm. But I just couldn't, was, you know, I'm a working musician. I just you couldn't can't play it. it. Right. I know. I know. And uh, when I retire, I'll buy another one because I love those instruments. But but this guitar that Brian is building does all those things that a, a real beautiful arch top does. I can play classical music on it. Mm -hmm. It's got even response. You can play full chords above the 12th fret with no wolf tones, with even sustain on every note. Uh, it's just a, 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 mar a remarkable achievement. And uh, and I think that jazz guitarists should should explore what he's doing because it's uh it's really empowering i mean i love traditional arch tops but as many doors as they open you know people have been making 175s and 335s for the past 50 years for a reason because the arch top as much as we love it it sometimes fails in the in those other applications well as soon as the volume goes up the tone goes to hell because you have right. to do so many things to be able to play the thing on stage that um, by the time you get finished removing all the, all the resonances that you have to remove to avoid the feedback, you got nothing left. Exactly that's right. That's the hell of it. If you're playing in a you know, small venue, everybody, you know, eight, under 80 dB, 85 dB, you're fine. As soon as you go above that, then you, the law, it just, they go to hell in a handbasket. And um, right. that's just the way it is. And I'm, I'm sure that, you know, there's some, I'll get arguments about that. I'm glad I put that out in this, uh, this video, but I'll get arguments about that. But the traditional arch top, especially one that where the pickup is not cut into the guitar. Um, it was, boy, that's, I, I, I did it for eight or nine years. I played an artist award, original artist award with the little DRM and pickup that I had the little, the one eighth inch plug connector. Right. <laughs> did you yeah. have that? Did you have one of those? Was it that old? Yeah. All right. Yeah. You know how many of those? I break that thing every week. Right. Me and, the guy Shack, me and the guy at Radio Shack, I had a revolving account in there. You know, I had to go in and get so many freaking plugs. 
So I did it. I did it. And, uh, but yeah. it's a tough, tough way to go. Yeah. Now I got to tell you, this is an honor. It's a, it's a thrill yeah. to, to talk to you. And, and, and um, you know, and I appreciate your intelligence and the way that you go about this whole thing. Your father, the scientist, boy, that's not, that's not a surprise to me at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and I'll, I'll tell you, man, we're working on, on a bunch of stuff to, uh, to, to, to bring this music and, and keep it going. So I've got like an art center. That I'm working on right now, and a little retreat up up in Wisconsin that we'll be able to do. Well, keep us aware so, of all that. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thank you for reaching out, man. Thanks for it. Bye bye now.